Our next speaker is, is Dr. Lisa Mullen. Um, Lisa is a teaching associate in modern and contemporary literature and film at Cambridge University. Her work spans questions of embodiment, eco-poesis, and the ethics and hermeneutics of form. She's the author of Mid-Century Gothic, The Uncanny Objects of Modernity in British Literature and Culture after the Second World War, uh, published by Manchester University Press in 2019. And her next book will be Orwell Unwell, Interruptions of Embodiment in the Fiction and Journalism of George Orwell. Her paper today is entitled A Kind of Grow Your Own Narrative and Writing the Cancer Memoir in Jenny Diskey's Ingratitude. Oh, lovely, thank you, Lisa. Thanks very much. Um, so I, I hopefully there's been some interesting point, points of uh, correspondence between this paper and Eliza's paper, as, as you'll see when I begin it. Um, and I'm looking forward to being able to discuss this later. Um, so in, the, in my paper, I want to unravel some of the carefully nested metatextual entanglements of ingratitude. I read this cancer memoir as the witness to Disky's grappling, not only with the knowledge of her own impending death, and um, with the impossibility of really knowing what is going to die, but with the authorial questions that this impossibility raises. Indeed, Disky insists that these epistemological and aesthetic questions must be linked if they are to make any sense. As her physical body fails, she re-examines her body of work as a record of her process of self-conscious becoming as a writer, a lifelong dialectical engagement with ways of saying and being, and of not saying and not being. Ingratitude both records the culmination of this process and anticipates the moment when all becoming will cease. She wants not only to understand and for her readers to understand why she has lived as she has lived, but also to attempt to materialize her own demise in textual form, to hold it in her hand in advance and to place it into its correct relational aspect to the other things that have happened to her and which have become the material of her work. In the book's first pages, Disky lays out her approach to materialization and remediation by her account of the meeting at which her oncologist first delivers his terminal diagnosis. She begins with an admission of the fearful limitations of thought and utterance, which paralyze the subject at such moments of existential jeopardy. She imagines her doctor as, in, as suffering irritably the implications of his lofty omniscience. He is perpetually forced to endure the feeble attempts of his patients to stave death off with feeble jokes about the television show Breaking Bad. If I hear one more patient, oh, sorry, I'll do it this way. If I hear one more patient say that they should start cooking meth, she imagines him grumbling. I'm going to wrestle them to the ground and bellow death into their faces. Pay attention, I'm fucking telling you something important. Disky, who has made this joke about crystal meth herself, is mortified to think that she has committed what she calls her first platitude. Her response, now that she comes to write the scene, is narrative. She refashions the limp encounter as a shouty vignette defiantly obliterating her weak joke with the doctor's angry outburst, the first vital image of her memoir. This is a fictional scenario of her own making, full of sound and fury, signifying death not as nothingness, but as a violent intervention in normal modes of discourse, and the utterance of death, indeed, as a murderous assault on the listener. In Illness as Metaphor, Susan Sontag describes how cancer has traditionally been ascribed to the repression of unuttered truths. It was common in the 1970s to cite dubious studies that found cancer victims to be, quote, low gear persons, seldom prey to outbursts of emotion. Sontag unpicks this assumption and locates its political origin in the imaginative construction of late capitalism. Cancer is described in images that sum up the negative behavior of homo economicus, abnormal growth, repression of energy, that is, refusal to consume or spend. Sorry. Breaking Bad represents the apotheosis of this reading of cancer. Walter White, the repressed chemistry teacher, becomes the ultimate capitalist anti-hero, peddling the most addictive and harmful product imaginable and amassing wealth that he cannot spend he becomes the tumour within the body of society. By making and then disowning her Breaking Bad joke, 
Diskey is both nodding towards this metaphor of cancer as capitalism and sharing Sontag's critique of the punitive psychological theories of illness which underlie it. To accept the analogy between cancer and capitalism is to accept an epistemological failure. Sorry, my lamp is misbehaving. Hang on a second, it's about to brain me. Okay, death by lamp would be a new one, wouldn't it? Um, so by making and disowning her breaking bad joke, Diskey is both nodding towards this metaphor of cancer and capitalism and sharing Sontag's critique of the punitive psychological theories of illness which underlie it. Okay, I'll just leave it there. Um, to accept the analogy between um, to accept the analogy between cancer and capitalism is to accept an epistemological failure. The metaphor delineates an empty space where knowledge ought to be. As Sontag puts it, theories that diseases are caused by mental states and can be cured by willpower are always an index of how much is not understood about the physical terrain of a disease. Thus, Diskey's initial binary opposition between inert metaphor and the brutal bellow of truth is complicated by her growing appreciation of the way truth may bloom in unexpected may bloom unexpectedly from the barren concrete of the commonplace. Halfway through in gratitude, she returns again to the primal prognosis scene with her oncologist, the scene where she drew her line in the sand against platitude, and reformulates it once more with a new set of images. Right at the start, I was in a funk about the avalanche of cliches that hung over my head in a bucket and that we would all, me included, tip up to cover me as if with pig's blood at my first and last prom, she writes. The reference is to Stephen King's 1974 horror film, horror novel Carrie, and more specifically to Brian De Palma's 1976 film version of it. Like so many of the dissonant pop cultural references which pepper Disky's memoir, this one is freighted with subtext. Those familiar with this text will remember that the maternal abuse suffered by Carrie White coincided with the troubling onset of puberty, and note how this recalls Disky's own abused childhood and her sense that her impending sexual maturity was experienced as something shameful by her own mother, and later as threatening by her pseudo-mother, Doris Lessing. Thus, the famous prom scene, in which the timid figure of Carrie is humiliatingly drenched in blood, connects with the deepest structures of Disky's imagination. By evoking the archetype of the bad mother, this reference to Carrie links Disky's battle against self-disgust to her themes of death and uncanny resurrection. Carrie too can be read as a book about mothers and cancer. King's own mother was dying of cancer while he completed his manuscript, which lends a chilling aspect to a scene where Carrie's mother compares being pregnant to suffering from, quote, a cancer of the womanly parts. We must remember that Carrie White, like her close namesake, Walter White, refused to play the role of passive, passive victim. Even her own death could not stop her, as the film's equally famous final image of Carrie's hand jerking up out of the grave makes clear. This reference to, the, to undead defiance stretches forward to the final pages of Ingratitude, which will end on another Carrie-esque note, with Disky remembering the whiteness of the clothes that she was made to wear as a child and how the start of her menstruation panicked her purity-obsessed mother. Blood, fury, death and resurrection. These are what we think of when Disky introduces the scene from Carrie into her meditation on cliché. Yet of course, thanks to De Palma's film, the pig's blood, pig's blood prom scene is also a visual cliché, the subject of decades of parodies, cinematic in-jokes and Halloween fancy dress costumes. Within the course of this short sentence, Disky has executed a conceptual swerve, which turns the image of an avalanche of clichés itself a cliche, from a blank whiteout into a blood red horror show and conjured up a cultural wormhole which concertina's time and space, carrying us back to King's rural Maine in the 1970s and Lessing's London in the 1960s, as well as forward to Disky's own end and the ending of her book. But can this one simple sentence sustain such, such referential multitudes without collapsing? As ingratitude progresses and more and more incidents of these rich layers of reference and ironic self-commentary are amassed, it becomes hard not to see this as a deliberate provocation by which the author hopes to encompass the ineffable subject of death and in some way survive it. The fractal expansion and elaboration of ideas sweeps up anything and everything in its path, abolishing distinctions between pop and high culture. One moment Disky is quoting Beckett and Nabokov, Don Giovanni, Jane Eyre, the next it's Disney films and The Terminator. She wants us to see cliches 
not as her invented bellowing oncologist saw them, as platitudes to be obliterated by a blast of truth, but as sly cheaters of mortality, empty vessels ready to contain new truth. If people reach so readily for a cliche, it's because there's something they can't say, she says, or even think. When Beckett or Nabokov twist a commonplace into an oh-so-considered sentence, it too does the work of the uncanny, the too well-known as unknown. I fucking love cliches. Such desperate attachment to unending elaboration is thus a function of her terminal prognosis. Without the imaginative engine which breathes new life into dying cultural cliché, she is undone. She is reduced to an amorphous patch of uncertainty, which lacks even a proper pronoun by which to define its existence, and lapses into terminal and paradoxically unending silence. I was left with a new and special kind of endlessness, she writes, like infinity, but without you, by which I mean me, you, and then not you, me, and then not impossible sentence to finish. Badisky death is the ultimate unsayable, unthinkable thing, not because of conceptual cowardice, but simply on the Cartesian basis that nothing can be said or th thought without an eye to say or think it. I learned the meaning of being lost for words, she writes. I came up against the horizon of language. So clinging to the figurative to save my life, I vaguely grasped that the end of the infinite might be where death started. If Disky experiences the process of writing as the personal remediation of experience into aesthetic order, then encroaching death threatens to erode this mediating mechanism, untethering writing from experience and revealing them both as something alien and uncanny. In gratitude, with its repeated restless iterations of the incidents and ideas which have shaped her life, catches Disky in the act of clinging onto the figurative and the murkily metaphorical. We watch her playing and replaying the reels of her experience and re-uttering herself recursively, defensively. By making herself a fabrication, she's attempting to write herself back into existence. Like Penelope in Ithaca, she will repeatedly weave and undo a funeral shroud in order to cheat time and fate. Like Scheherazade, she will throw narrative cliffhangers into the darkness to ward off death. Yet Disky is unlike these two wily women in one important way. Her work of willed unendingness is not a distraction, but an attentive anatomization of creativity itself, and specifically the outrages committed by the quasi-authorial hand of motherhood and by the quasi-motherhood of another author, Doris Lessing. The long section Disky writes about her unhappy years as Lessing's ward record her furious attempts to get the older writer to see her properly as a fully formed entity and not as a distracting wraith, a half-written character, or an undiagnosed collection of symptoms. This looks at first glance to be an act of deathbed revenge, and perhaps in, it was in one sense, but just as a malignant tumour can be seen via Disky's invocation of Carrie as a dark counterpart to the uncannily autonomous growth of a fetus, so the writer's text can be seen as a kind of gestation both something that she is doing and simultaneously something that is happening within and beyond her. What is growing is a new version of her life as yet unwritten, but now demanding to be put into words. When Disky describes ingratitude as a kind of grow your own narrative, it is part of an injunction to the reader that they should pause, put down the book and turn to Disky's earlier memoir, Skating to Antarctica, and then come back and see what happens when you add when you add Doris absent in that telling to the equation, a kind of grow your own narrative, just take some responsibility, but you are after the truth. And truth apparently is all inside one person's head, not shredded and scattered about to be ordered as in any way you see fit. Yet Disky's own practice as a writer has always involved gather, gathering up such scattered shreds and weaving them into a glossy scheme of textual material a Mobius strip of mutated themes and morphing images. The zone of blood red open-endedness in, in which body and medicine meet, each defining and completing the other, thus finds a ready-made ready series of metaphorical analogues in her memoir's armature of cultural precursors, which must now also include the two Lessing novels, which contain more or less recognizable portraits of the young Disky, uh, namely, Briefing for a Descent into Hell and the Memoirs of a Survivor. Memoirs and briefings sit on my shelves, Disky writes in Ingratitude, quietly filled with Doris's take on me 
and aspects of my life reinterpreted for fiction. I only read each of them once in manuscript. Until now, they've been patiently bearing my sideways glance, waiting for me to take another look and to think about what I think about them in terms of my real life and also in terms of fiction and all the ways in which writers, including me, quite legitimately appropriate bits and pieces of lives and people for their own ends. Disky points silently to these other books, but leaves us to draw our own conclusions, to grow our own narrative and take responsibility for it. But the fact that they exist on her shelf and exchange glances with her is enough to allow their presence to ripple out meaningfully into the surrounding structure of her cancer memoir and the seafaring travel memoir that preceded it. Skating to Antarctica recounts Disky's relationship with her first dysfunctional mother and her queasy attempt in middle age to come to terms with the abuse that she suffered. Disky's visceral reaction to her surfacing memories takes the form of extreme flight. She seeks out the coldest and whitest and most distant place she can find from which to contemplate her descent into mental illness, illness which would continue to, to pick at her frayed edges for the rest of her life. Here, as in Ingratitude, we find Disky reconciling herself to her status as a patient, a repeatedly hospitalised tangle of pathologies, disputed diagnoses and bad treatments. To read Skating to Antarctica is to believe that this is the definitive account of Disky's foundational medical narrative. But the reader of Ingratitude now learns that it was no such thing, since the earlier book makes no mention of blessing at all. Just as we must read Skating to Antarctica through the lens of Ingratitude, we must also read Ingratitude through the lens of Skating to Antarctica. Each is the missing piece of the other. Amongst many other things, Skating to Antarctica is about such lenses and their limitations. Disky describes how she's accompanied on her trip to the ends of the earth by a collection of tourists who generally prefer to frame their experience through the viewfinder of a camera or a camcorder, if anybody remembers what a camcorder was. She observes with horrified fascination those who turn their holiday into instant news reports, muttering commentaries into built-in microphones as they tilt and zoom. This too seems like a mental illness to her. To anyone not aware of the purpose of the camcorder, she writes, we would have been mistaken for a party of the deranged. For her part, Disky refuses to record mechanically anything that she sees. Memory, she says, resides in discrete packets dotted all over the place and is continually created, a story told and retold using jigsaw pieces of experience. This is the image of scattered pieces of truth to which she will return in ingratitude. So that when she accuses the readers of her final book of wanting some illusory totalizing version of her life, and directs them back to skating to Antarctica, she's inviting us to share the critique of this touristic methodology which she expanded there. Specifically, I think she is inviting us to remember how her encounter with a group of elephant seals on a beach in Gritviken, South Georgia, was compromised by the need to duck and swerve and apologize her way past the triangular patches of the world carved out by those who felt that their camera entitled them to ownership of the scene. A miniature form of colonization, Disky calls it. Just as she will do with the oncology doctor, Disky writes a little scene to help her evade the authoritative lens of another. In this case, the other is a large American called Big Jim. Having imagined the domestic picture show which Jim will preside over when he gets back home, including video of Disky standing beside, beside a seal, she addresses him directly and ironically. Hi, Jim, she waves. Waving to Jim, she is waving to herself and to us too. And the wave extends now from one text to another, to the readers of Ingratitude, who have been sent here. But how do we know that we have been sent here specifically to this very scene on the beach and its rumination on the inadequacy of the camera as a technological prosthetic for memory? Consider this strange passage in Disky's description of her experience of radiotherapy. The entire process makes me think of clubbing baby seals Although the seals I'm familiar with aren't adorable chubby babies, but glossy black athletic adults sleeping for fish at feeding time in London Zoo when I was small, and gigantic elephant seals lounging on the shore in an Antarctic bay, paying not the slightest attention to me as I picked my way through the spaces they leave between them. Vast blub blubber sacks lolling shapeless with fat, their truncated trunks flaccid, concealing lipstick red mouths and throats that appear when they open wide to yawn. No, not them. Baby seals, small, helpless, newborn, cute, white ones with big watery eyes. This is a particularly murky metaphor, as Disky might call it, 
It allows her to switch rapidly between her present predicament, her compromised childhood, and her adult life, her persona as a writer of travel books, and her persona as a writer of a cancer memoir. She seems almost exhilarated by being barely in control of this image. We never learn exactly why or how radiotherapy reminds her of the hypothetical baby seals who are so roughly shoved aside by blacker or redder versions. Despite what she says, she's not convincingly reminded of small watery baby seals at all, but of the other kind about which we learn a lot, though they pay not the slightest attention to the writerly mind trying to organize them into a metaphor. The nauseating openness of this metaphorical landscape, like the joltingly intimate throats of the elephant seals, seems to beckon in all and any possibility of meaning. And if that open-endedness risks tumbling into incoherence, then we are reminded to remember the resistance of the seals to Big Jim and his camera, and the limitations of mere coherence as a strategy for proper understanding. It's not particularly fashionable to evoke Roland Barthes' The Death of the Author these days, but I find it irresistible here, his notion that by entering into the act of writing, the author enters into her own death. We now know that a text is not a line of words releasing a single theological meaning, the message of the author God, but a multi-dimensional space in which a variety of writings, none of them original, blend and clash. The author's only power is to mix writings, to counter the ones with the others in such a way as never to rest on any one of them. He calls this the author's only power, but in Disky, this work of unwriting amounts to a superpower. The restlessness of her text enables the self-consciously provocative ontologies of the uncanny, a recalcitrance to death itself. As the end of Ingratitude approaches, the diminishing slab of unread pages materialise the time that the author is running out of. As both author and book drift off into a sedative fuzziness, can, uh, Disky's authorial edges become blurred. We feel increasingly uneasy. Cancer memoirs are supposed to end on a note of sublime acceptance from the dearly departed, a peaceful platitude, followed perhaps by a dignified epilogue penned by a grieving other. But Disky has spent the whole book resisting this terminal momentum. The zoescope of imagery which she has painstakingly set in motion continues to shift and fidget. The memoir closes on a confluence of mothers and whiteness and spilt blood, which tugs the whole book briefly into focus once more. The final sentence reads, the mishmash, the mishmash suddenly made the only sense. Mishmash whirled round and pulled together in a kind of Disney dance, which hasn't been made, but should have been made because it's a much better story than Beauty and the Beast. What is this better story? We flip the pages backwards and forwards and look for clues. We cast around in our memories of the fairy tale or the animated film or in the autobiographical or lessing written pre precursors to ingratitude. But the unwritten is only there as an absence. In the end, we must grow our own story to overcome this authorial silence, take some responsibility as the absent author, still waving to us from the ends of the earth, endlessly insists. Thank you.